Welcome to the GeoJot Plus tutorial series. In this session, administrators will learn how to configure the GeoJot Plus app for their field users. While GeoJot Plus app is really simple to use in the field, most organizations choose to set it up ahead of time. When it's configured properly, field teams just go out, take out their cameras, take pictures, enter data, and that's pretty much it. All the information goes up to the cloud and back onto the desktop to be processed and reports are created. But for that to work really well, you need to set up the app specific to your organization. We're going to go ahead and do a demonstration using an Android device. While I'm bringing that up, I'll note if you're using the GeoJot Plus trial, you're able to use GeoJot on five different Android devices and five different desktops. When you purchase GeoJot Plus, you'll decide how many devices you want to use it on, and you'll probably want to set up all the devices uh, very similarly. When you begin that, um, you're going to begin by installing GeoJot Plus app on your device. You can actually install it on multiple devices, but to activate it, you need to use the confirmation email that you got when you first purchased the software or signed up for a free trial. Sorry. When we signed up for a free trial, we got a, um, a confirmation email sent to us, and it came to this device here. And so we're going to find, there it is. And we notice at the top it's got the serial number information, and if you scroll down a little ways, it shows you some links for the app. You can either choose the Apple link or the Android link. Now if you're sending this to people out in the field, you may just want to copy this portion of the email, this top portion with the serial number, and send just that part so they don't get confused by the other portions of GeoJot Plus. Now for this demonstration, we are on Android, so we're going to click the Android link. This brings us to the, Geo, the, the store showing GeoJot. You'll click Install, and it will install. Now, just um, in case you don't know, when you use the App Store on, uh, on any device, you usually have to have a specific email account. In the case of Apple, you have to have an Apple ID. In the case of Android, you have to have a Gmail account. OK, now we're ready to open up GeoJot Plus. And once it opens up, it'll ask us to activate the software. We've done this before, so you can see some pre-filled information. But you want to fill in the information specific to the user who will be on this device. Because when you, as an administrator, log into the administrative dashboard, you're going to be able to tell people apart by the information provided here. So again, the information that was in that email is what we're putting in right here. And then we click Activate. And now, well, oops, you have to put in the correct email address. There we go. Now, once we've activated, it says activation successful. Um, and this is the home screen of GeoJot Plus on your mobile device. There are quite a few things uh, you might want to go through and set up, but most people want to begin by setting up their Dropbox account. If you're not already familiar with Dropbox, the best way I find to think about it is Dropbox is kind of like another folder on your computer, like a shared drive. And the idea is that you're trying to share this drive with both your desktops or your computers and your mobile devices. So what you're going to do is go down under Settings and uh, pick the cloud. And right now, we only work with Dropbox, so we're going to click on Provider. And we're going to choose Dropbox as the provider. And we need to log in. Now, hopefully, you've already signed up for a Dropbox account. And you'll want to use the same Dropbox account for all the mobile devices and for the desktop portion. So you can click uh, Link to Dropbox Plus and link there. And then you'll just log on to your Dropbox account. And you do want to give it access to Dropbox. If you don't already have a Dropbox account, um, this little guide will help you set one up. We recommend you don't download the Dropbox app to your phone. You don't need it. And it can sometimes compete with our app to try and send uh, photos back. So if you do have the Dropbox app on your uh, mobile device, you'll want to make sure to disable the auto send of photos. OK, now we're connected to Dropbox. Let's go back to the menu. And we'll go back to settings again. 
And I want to show you some of the neat things you can do within Dropbox. Um, go back to Cloud. Okay, so we have Dropbox set up. Now there's a few other features. Auto Send right now has a check mark next to it. That means each time you take a photo, it will automatically send the photo up to Dropbox, assuming that you have some kind of a connection. If you don't have a connection, either through Wi-Fi or um, through your mobile plan, all those photos will just wait in a queue until you do have a link again, at which point they'll start sending. Now the Wi-Fi only box is what you can check if you only want to send the photos when you have a Wi-Fi connection. That's a good way to save, save on your uh, data plan, or it also speeds things up if it uses the Wi-Fi. Now down below there, we have two other folder looking things path and subfolder. Let me talk to you about path first. Both of these are how you're going to store your photo on, um, on Dropbox. Because Dropbox, like I said, it's like a shared drive. And so this allows you to create folders and subfolders within that drive to help you organize your data. Path, when you click on there, this is a static drive. So whatever you type here is going to be a folder within Dropbox under which you can find your items. Now, it defaults to something called GeoJot Plus, so you know that's where they came from. But you can give it any name you like. We're going to name ours North Glen, because we're doing a project for the city of North Glen. Um, you may want to have this be different projects. You may want to have it be the names of your different field tree teams, uh, however you'd like to organize your data. But this is the static path, so every photo that's taken while this is um, in there is going to go under that folder. And you can also have subfolders within. So this is our uh, the name we're going to give it. So this is the path. And in a minute I'll show you how that looks on Dropbox. Now the subfolder is kind of fun because it's dynamic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So click on subfolder and we can see that we can choose an attribute. So for example in, in our example we're doing a sign inventory for the city of North Glen. And then each time we see a sign we're going to um, assign it a uh, property uh, of what needs to happen, an action that's required. And we're going to assign that to a memo. Uh, so each time we get to that memo, we're going to have to say, is it going to be, uh, is it fine, does it need to be repaired, or does it need to be replaced? And depending on which attribute you choose for that sign, that will create a subfolder within your path, and uh, the photos will be stored accordingly. So in our case, we chose memo one is what we're going to use for the subfolder. Okay, now I'm going to show you how that's going to look in Dropbox. On your desktop, you'll see the little Dropbox icon. It's usually on the lower right. It looks like a little open blue box. And when you open it, like I said, it looks like a drive. And these are the many different paths that we chose. So this is our North Glen path. And when we open that up, we can see the dynamic folders that were created here in our sign inventory. There's action, repair, and replace, or no action, sorry. And if you were to click on any of those, you would see the photos that we took, which got this attribute. All right, so these are all the signs we found that needed repair. So this is a handy way for you to organize your work. You may have a team taking a bunch of photos, but if you want to easily find the photos that need action, you can separate them in their own folder and then send these photos out to the repair crews. So that concludes the Dropbox portion of our, um, of our setup. Now we're going to go back to the main menu and go back under uh, settings. And there's a few other uh, settings you might be interested in. Under units, um, you can actually change the units that are displayed. Um, if you need a different coordinate system, if you need to use uh, feet versus meters, or you want direction to show up differently, you can go there. Um, yeah, you can even do UTM here. Then we'll go back to the main menu under settings. By the way, on Android, if you're not familiar, there's a back button that you can use to move between screens, and that doesn't exist on Apple's. Okay, down under advanced features, there's a few advanced features I want to point out to you which might uh, make a difference in, for your field teams. The first one is required accuracy. This defaults to off. Um, but as you know, with mobile devices, sometimes they'll use the cell phone uh, towers if they can't get a GPS signal. And that could be wildly inaccurate. And other times, it gets a GPS signal that can be more accurate. So you can set this requirement to be a minimum level if 
your photo doesn't meet that requirement, or your camera isn't getting a good enough signal, it will not allow you to take the picture. It will give you a warning. So some people want to set this uh, for high, medium, or low. Really, any of these settings are probably using the GPS rather than the cell phone towers. But that's one feature you can use. We'll cancel that for now. Another feature is the clear lock. Now, when you take a photo, uh, and we'll show you on the camera screen what this looks like. When you take a photo, um, you're able to just walk up to an item, and you can see, uh, you know, you can collect the data. So you click lock on, it'll actually lock the GPS coordinates right where they are. Then you can back up from the item and take a picture, and you're capturing the coordinate of the item itself, not where you're standing, which is great. But that lock will stay on, so if you forget to turn it off and you wander down to the next item, all your photos will have the same location unless you remember to unclick that button and, uh, and then click it back on when you do it again. Now, the advanced setting I'm talking about automatically takes off that um, lock after each photo. So if your workflow consists of walking up to an item, locking the GPS, stepping back and taking a photo, go ahead and click there, and then you're going to move on to the next one, it would be good to have this checked. Okay, the next advanced feature we want to talk about is the retain values. When you're entering in attributes after each photo, um, if you have this box clicked, it will just keep the same values entered after the last photo for the next photo. This is great in that it saves time in the field. The downside is if you don't check it, it will just stay the same indefinitely. So sometimes people want their field teams to have to re-enter the data, in which case you would keep this off. If you want the fields to remain the same each time and just have them change if something's different, then you check the box on. And the last item is a way to connect to a laser rangefinder. We'll be doing a different video that describes that, so look for that video. Okay, that's it for our advanced features. Now I'd like to walk you through just a couple of features with the camera settings. As you noticed in our earlier part of this demonstration, when you're, um, when you're on the camera screen, you can see certain things, uh, and you can adjust those here. But another thing you can adjust is the camera capture size. So this is how big you want to save the photos. It defaults to whatever the device's default is, but you can make them smaller when you click here. And that will save space um, on your um, on your device, it'll, but also affects the quality of the photo itself. Smaller photos do send faster, however. Okay, then the file name prefix. You can actually name uh, the photos, uh, give them a prefix to their name, so that you can more easily identify which photos which. The file name prefix, again, is fixed, kind of like the Dropbox was. So um, all the photos can have the same name. And the file name attribute is dynamic, so that you can choose a particular attribute, and each photo will take on that part of the attribute to the name. So again, if the action required is our, uh, our chosen attribute, then the file might be named um, GeoJot Repair 01, uh, and then the next one that needs a repair would be called Repair 02, and so on and so forth. Okay, then the camera folder. This is uh, something uh, that shows you where on the device this information is stored. Is it on, in the case of an Android, we have SD cards, uh, so you can store it there. Uh, and that keeps it from getting mixed up with your personal uh, photos that you may have. And then the Use External Camera app is specific to uh, some devices, particularly Androids, and when you're using a camera um, that runs Android in the operating system. You may want to choose this because it allows you to use the full functionality of the actual camera, like a Nikon or Sony or whatnot. Uh, and so that's just a way to get more out of the actual camera features. That's it for the description of the configuration. I recommend that you, um, when you figure out all the settings that you want for your field teams, you create a checklist for yourself. And then with each device, you just go down the checklist and you fill in the attributes and the file names and the things you want it the way you want it, and you'll be up and running in no time. Thank you very much for your time, and please remember to check out the other tutorials for GeoJot Plus.